welcome to this Essential Legal Foundation course. This course is going to help you understand and learn about that foundation topic which is going to assist you for the rest of your legal career. Why understanding this topic is necessary for any law student or anyone who is interested in how to interpret the statutes and how legislation is drafted by expert draftsmen. Let's take an example to understand how small things make a difference, let alone different words used in legislation. But once you have known the techniques of interpreting statutes, you will not only be confident in dealing with expertly written statutory language, but will also be able to argue complex legal points if you are a practicing lawyer. The example is, and it is a very well-known example, a woman without her man is nothing. Apparently, this is a very simple sentence, but this may be subject to analysis depending upon how you read it. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put punctuation in these sentences. Let's see how you understand these. A woman, comma, without her, comma, man is nothing. As you can see in this sentence, the sentence now highlights the importance of a woman in a man's life. But if we change punctuation, you will see it is completely different meaning. For example, a woman, Colin, without her man, comma, is nothing. Now what does this show? This highlights, just with the change of that punctuation, we haven't changed anything else, just the punctuation, but this highlights the importance of a man in a woman's life. Let's change it again. A woman without semicolon, her man is nothing. This, although this is considered more of a literary nature, it suggests that it is good that the woman is now without her man who was simply useless. So you can see how these small punctuations make a big difference. Imagine the difficulties that may be presented by arguably the most important piece of writing that is legislation, drafted by expert draftsmen, interpreted by expert judges, and argued by eminent lawyers and academicians. I am sure most of you would be aware of a very famous United States case where the employees won the case because of an Oxford comma. The state's law stated this, the canning comma processing comma preserving comma freezing, drying, marketing, storing comma packing for shipment or distribution of agricultural produce, meat and fish products, and perishable foods. Circuit Judge Barron started the judgment with these words. For want of a comma, we have this case. The drivers in this case argued that packing covers shipment and distribution, both activities, and they should be paid over time, pay for both. Previously, a lower court judge had said that there are two separate activities and the drivers were outside the overtime law's protection. The court said, since there was no comma after shipment, they are both covered. If there was a comma, then there would be two separate activities. But interpretation is not just about the commas. It's not just about the punctuation. These are only simplest of the examples. We are going to look at the problems and solutions of interpretation throughout this course. I am Tofan Hussain and I will be your instructor for this course. I'm a barrister and a researcher in online legal learning. I'm going to teach you this course and leave you with quizzes and exercises which you can undertake at the end of this course to cement your learning and help support your understanding of this fundamental topic of law. I've seen that law students have always expressed and felt a need for a good understanding of two fundamental topics, that is interpretation of statutes and the doctrine of precedent. This course is one of those two courses which only concentrate upon these two topics, how to interpret the statutes and what's the doctrine of precedent.
These courses aim to concentrate upon those two fundamental topics of law that any student should master before they go on the journey of making sense of the parliamentary legislation, case law and the law in general. See you in the first lecture. Interpretation of statutes and why is it necessary? There are four sources of English law. Well, used to be, as EC law won't be a source of English law after Brexit, uh, but there used to be four main sources, case law, parliamentary legislation, EC law, and the European Convention on Human Rights. As you know, European Convention on Human Rights was brought into the UK law under the Human Rights Act 1998. So it won't be wrong if we say that the main sources of English law now are case law, parliamentary legislation and the Human Rights Act 1998, although it is a parliamentary legislation, but the fountain is European Convention on Human Rights. Due to the democratic principles, it is the parliament's job to make laws and it is for the courts to interpret them. Remember that the courts and the judges are not lawmakers. The constitutional principles of separation of powers require the courts to interpret the laws made by the executive and the legislature. In the case of Dewport Steels Limited against Sirs, Lord Diplock put this principle in the following words, Parliament makes the laws, the judiciary interpret them. When Parliament legislates to remedy what the majority of its members at the time perceive to be a defect or a lacuna in the existing law, whether it be the written law enacted by existing statutes or the unwritten common law, as it has been expounded by the judges in decided cases, the role of the judiciary is confined to ascertaining from the words that Parliament has approved as expressing its intention, what that intention was, and to giving effect to it. Where the meaning of the statutory words is plain and unambiguous, it is not for the judges to invent fancied ambiguities as an excuse for failing to give effect to its plain meaning, because they themselves consider that the consequences of doing, doing so would be inexpedient or even unjust or immoral. In controversial matters, such as are involved in industrial relations, there is room for differences of opinion as to what is expedient, what is just, and what is morally justifiable. Under our constitution, it is Parliament's opinion on these matters that is paramount. Lord Diplock also stated, if this be the case, it is for Parliament, not for the judiciary, to decide whether any changes should be made to the law as stated in the Act. In the same case, Lord Scarman stated, if Parliament says one thing but means another, it is not, under the historic principles of the common law, for the courts to correct it. We are to be governed not by Parliament's intentions, but by Parliament's enactments. Why is statutory interpretation necessary and fundamental to the legal know-how? You know, lawyers and judges need to interpret the laws frequently. They may include primary and secondary legislation and contractual and commercial documentation. Principles of statutory interpretation help the students of law and the legal professionals to make sense of the legal documents within the boundaries set by the laws of the land. There are several reasons why statutory interpretation is necessary. Let's discuss all those reasons uh, one by one. They are the main reasons. Number one. In order to resolve uncertainty in the law, the statutes are required to be interpreted in a consistent manner. So there is element of consistency. The laws are made for the general public and the public should feel confident in their dealings without fearing unexpected results of any subsequent litigation. 
For example, in the case of R against Secretary of State for the Environment, Transport and the Regions and another, X parts Path Home Limited. Lord Nicholas stated that citizens with the assistance of their advisers are intended to be able to understand parliamentary enactments so that they can regulate their conduct accordingly. Similar point was made by Lord Diplock in the case of Father Jill against Monarch Airlines Limited in the following words. It would be a confidence trick by Parliament and destructive of all legal certainty if the private citizens could not rely upon that meaning but was required to search through all that had happened before and in the course of the legislative process in order to see whether there was anything to be found from which it could be inferred that Parliament's real intention had not been accurately expressed by the actual words that Parliament had adopted to communicate it to those affected by the legislation. Point number two. Words and terms used in legislation may cause serious problems and may result in unintended and obnoxious consequences. Usually, and depending upon the context, words may have more than one meaning equally relevant and capable of interpretation in the given legislation. This may cause serious difficulties for the courts and the litigants. Point number three. There may be a change in the language used in a statute and the meaning of the words may change over time. The rules of statutory interpretation help the courts to deal with such issues. Point number four. A parliamentary statute may contain errors and issues. The mistakes may go unnoticed during the legislative process, in particular where the bill has been amended several times. Point number five. Development in technology means that the courts may need to cover the modern day situations while applying the old statutes. For example, the courts included telephones when interpreting Telegraph Act 1869, despite the fact that telephones were not invented at the time when the statute was passed. Point number six. Legislation may fail to deal with all eventualities and specific circumstances. Point number seven. Some words and terms may be applied and some rules may be presumed in relation to a statute. The courts need to give meaning to the statutes in light of the presumptions and implied meanings of the words and terms. Now that you have been introduced to statutory interpretation and why it is necessary, there are a couple of exercises to help yourself. First exercise is about summarizing the principle of statutory interpretation as laid down by Lord Diplock. And the second exercise is summarizing the importance of this statutory interpretation. Please refer to the following lecture to see the exercises and what is it that is expected of you. I will see you in the next lecture. Now let's look at how statutes are cited. Look at the following title of a statute, for example, Homelessness Reduction Act 2017, 
C13. You can see C13 here in the top right hand corner. This means that the act was passed in the year 2017 and was the 13th act passed in that year. C13 means chapter 13. This act can also be cited as 2017 C.13. In the past there have been different systems in place for citing statutes. In 1963 the old system called Ragnall year system was replaced by this new system and all of the statutes are now written in this simple and short form. In order to find old statutes in the libraries you need to know the old citation system although this is not intended to be a part of this course the previous systems have included the following statutes cited according to the name of the place where parliament passed the law for example the statute of Gloucester 1278 Regnal year system was in place until 1963. Each regnal year commenced with the anniversary of the monarch's accession to the throne. So for example, a statute cited as 4 Geo 4 C 34 means the 34th act passed in the fourth year of King George, the fourth rule, and C means chapter. Look at this example of Parliament Act 1911 old style citation pre-1963. This is another example. Now we are going to look at how statute is structured. A parliamentary statute consists of number of parts. We are going to discuss those parts one by one. Let's look at number one, short title. This is the example of Theft Act 1968. This is a short title of the act. Theft refers to the subject of the statute and 1968 is a year of its publication. Generally, statutes are referred to by their short titles. In, for example, cases, textbooks and journal articles. If the act is referred to frequently in any single piece of work this can be further abbreviated for example TA 1968. Let's look at the next part citation as you can see 1968 chapter 60 this is citation. This is how the act is officially cited. This citation is sufficient to look for this statute as there cannot be another statute with this citation. This citation could only mean Theft Act 1968. The word chapter may be abbreviated as we learned before as C or CH number 60 is a chapter number and it tells us that this is the 60th statute passed in the year 1968. As you can see in the top right hand corner of the statute chapter number can be abbreviated as CH 60 and that takes us nicely to the third point, long title. This is called the long title. Long title gives us some important information about the act and what is it that this statute is about. For example, the long title of this act shows that the act also covers associated offenses. This is important as we know where is the starting point to look if we come across any associated crimes. The long title seeks to provide general purpose of the act as well. And then next point, number four, date of royal ascent and that is given here, 26th of July 1968. The date provided at the end of this long title is the date when the bill was formally converted into act through royal, royal ascent. A statute will usually take effect when it receives the royal ascent unless a different commencement date is given by the statute. Commencement section can be found at the start or at the end of the statute and the relevant part of the statute is usually entitled as short title and commencement. Point number five, enacting words. These are the enacting words here of the statute, be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty by and with the advice and consent of the Lord's Spiritual and Temporal 
uh, and it goes on. These are the formal words that indicate that the statute was passed after going through the appropriate legislative process and with due authority. Then there are sections and subsections in each statute. The acts contain sections and may also contain subsections. In this example, the main section is section 1. Subsections may be referred to as section 1 1, section 1 2, section 1 3 for example. Subsections are usually intended to deal with different aspects of the same subject within the main section. They may contain explanations, exceptions and reference to other statutes. Sections can be abbreviated as S and the subsections can be abbreviated as double S or double S full stop. And they can then be further divided into subsections. For example, main section is two, subsection is one, and there is then further subsection and it will be called as 21A. And as you can see in the statute, this explains what is this section about. Uh, this is the definition of dishonesty. And there is a further point to make about definitions section. It is not necessary for the statute to expressly state and separate the definitions section. Definitions may simply be added in any part or chapter of the statute. If you look, for example, at this section 10, it does not state uh, this is definitions section. But as you can see, there are definitions just as we saw in relation to the section which defined dishonesty. This is aggravated burglary. Although this is a definitions section, but it is not stated at the start of the section. It may or it may not. And our next point is about paragraphs within the statute. This is an example of paragraphs 14.1a, 14.1b. Number 14 is the main section. One is the subsection. And A and B are the paragraphs within the subsection of the main section. Sometimes they are further divided into subparagraphs. Our next point is marginal notes. As you can see here on the right, extension to thefts from males outside England and Wales and robbery, etc. on such a theft. These are called marginal notes and these notes normally explain the contents of each section. Please note they are not part of the act and are not referred to by the courts in relation to the interpretation of statutes. So these points, notes are disregarded when it comes to interpretation of the statutes. Now our next point which is schedules. Point number 10. The acts may contain schedules at the end. The schedules may contain further explanations or relevant details to the main sections in the statutes. In this example, a schedule provides further provisions further to section 32 of the main body of the statute. It states here section 32 and schedule 1 in relation to offenses of taking etc. deer or fish. Taking or killing deers. And our next point is point 11 preamble. Why I discuss this preamble at the end when it comes at the start because it used to be found in the old acts and not in the new acts. In this example, um, this is the preamble of the Parliament Act 1911 and comes before the enacting formula of the statute. Preamble is an opening statement to the statute and usually seeks to provide the reason for the enactment of the statute. And if you look uh, at the meaning uh, of preamble in the dictionary, preamble means something that walks before. And while we are discussing Parliament Act 1911, uh, you should know that this Parliament Act 1911 is the source of enacting words and enactment formula that we learned uh, before. It states in section 4 that in every bill presented to His Majesty, these enacting words should be used, be it enacted by the King's Most. So this is the source of enactment formula. This is something for your knowledge. And our final point is explanatory notes to the statutes. This is an example of a new relatively statute, Homelessness Reduction Act 2017, Chapter 13, and sometimes they have explanatory notes. There may be explanatory notes that may help the courts in relation to the interpretation of the statutes. They may be prepared by the different government departments or committees. They are not part of a statute. In the case of Kelly and Gray, the Court of Appeal appreciated the assistance that it was able to seek from explanatory notes of a statute. 
This was despite the fact that in that case, the notes specifically stated that they do not form part of the bill and have not been endorsed by Parliament. Please see the example of one of the modern acts, Reduction of Homelessness Act 2017. You will see that this act and the Theft Act 1968 have similar structure. Now, our next lecture would be how to read a statute. See you in the next lecture. How to read a statute. There are certain rules to read a statute that you should keep at the forefront of your mind. Please be aware that every single word of the statute is chosen carefully and drafted after a prolonged discussion and consultation. Legislation process is a rigorous process and the expert draftsmen use every word and every punctuation for a reason. Take every word and punctuation in a statute seriously. Point number one. To start with, you should read the long title of a statute. The long title provides guidance as to the general purpose of the statute. Point number two. You should familiarize yourself with the Interpretation Act 1978 as it is a guiding statute for interpreting other statutes. Within a statute that you are reading, you should look at the definition or interpretation sections as they might provide specific meanings to the words and terms used in the statute. Please note that sometimes statutes may not expressly separate such sections and the definitions may be added in any part of the statute. They are usually added at the start of chapters in slightly longer statutes. Rule number three, it is always convenient to start with the content section in particular if the statute is a long one. For example, Companies Act 2006 do not rush and this is rule number four do not rush through statutes while reading them practitioners and judges take time to read statutes and usually go through the provisions more than once this is to make sure that the relevant clause is understood properly and nothing is overlooked also make sure this is rule number five that the statute or the provisions you are concerned with are in force. It may be that some of the provisions of a specific statute are not in force, despite the fact that major part of a statute may come into force at an earlier date. If possible, use online resources to check if there are any changes to the relevant statutes and obviously you will have to consult a reliable source for that, not any website um, on the web. Online resources are normally updated regularly if come from a reliable source compared to the paper resources. Rule number six. It is also a good idea to look at a few related cases to get help in relation to the relevant provisions of a statute. Now let's go on to our next lecture which is what are those problems which the interpreters may find in relation to statutory interpretation. For example lawyers and judges and students. See you in the next lecture. Problems in interpreting statutes. You will learn what types of problems an interpreter may face while interpreting statutes. Let's take an, as an example of the Utopian Act 2099, a hypothetical statute. Uh, one of the clauses state that it is a criminal offence to wear red cap while flying your vehicle near the residential buildings. Consider how different words used might give rise to problems of statutory interpretation. Write your points in the table below. It has been divided into two columns. One is a relevant word um, and the second is possible issues and questions. So please note down these words and then compare your answers to the answer that is suggested in the following lecture. Thank you. Let's look at the possible issues and questions when it comes to interpreting um, clauses of statutes. 
As you can see, all these words may be very straightforward at first, but once you start considering them, they may become ambiguous and subject to further discussion and analysis. The, the, the purpose of this basic example is to help you prepare your mind to appreciate the possible issues that the codes face in the interpretation of the statutes. Let's look at the example of way. Apparently, it would be a normal word, but what if somebody is wearing a hat on the arms or feet? It may sound funny, but when it comes to interpreting statutes, it is an important point, and you will see as you develop in your legal career. Red, what constitutes red? What if the color looks like orange or maroon? Similarly, cap, what types of hats are covered by the word cap? Um, you got the point. Look at the other words, vehicle, near, residential, buildings. These terms can give rise to a lot more questions rather than answering them. So these are the issues uh, which you might face when interpreting laws. Let's move on to our next lesson. Construction and interpretation. What is the difference? There is no difference between the words construction and interpretation as such. The terms are used for convenience purposes and to keep certain topics of statutory interpretation separate. For example, rules of construction may include literal and golden rules, and the rules of interpretation may deal with nosciter ossocius or nosciter ossocius. Different authors may take different approaches. This should be borne in mind though that these rules and principles are not legally binding. They are rather like tools that the judges keep in their minds and use them as and when needed, at times without even referring to or mentioning those rules. However, they are there and the courts utilize them according to their needs. Whether you want to call it construction of the statutes or interpretation of the statutes, your use of the terms will not be culpable. However, it is advised that in order to avoid any misunderstanding in relation to your assignments or exams, you use the term in a way you are taught by your tutor or lecturer in your class. Let's look at the authority of the rules of interpretation and construction. The rules of construction and interpretation are not laid down in the statutes and are developed by the decisions of the courts. They are there. They are mere principles and are not binding upon the courts. However, they are adhered by the courts to bring consistency, common sense and effectiveness of the legislation. The lawyers argue and the judges take different approaches to the interpretation of statutes. However, they cannot be argued as a final authority in relation to any piece of legislation and as such, any reference to previous cases in relation to interpretation may just be one of the aids being applied by the courts. We will now move on to our next section where we are going to learn different rules of constructions. The main ones are the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule. Let's start with the literal rule in our next section and the first lecture. Let's start with the first rule, the literal rule. The words in the statutes must be given their ordinary and literal meaning. Effectively, what it means is ordinary meaning that you can find in a dictionary. This is the general rule of interpreting any words or clauses within the statute. It is assumed that the draftsmen have chosen the words carefully and used those words in their ordinary meanings. This rule is applied unless there is a good reason to depart from this general rule. This rule was explained in the case of Sussex Peerage case 1844. It said the only rule for the construction of Acts of Parliament is that they should be construed according to the intent of the Parliament which passed the Act. If the words of the statute are in themselves precise and unambiguous, then no more can be necessary than to expound those words in their natural and ordinary sense. The words themselves alone do, in such case, best declare the intention of the lawgiver by Chief Justice Tyndall. 
And this is a logical rule that follows the ordinary principles of texts and language. If some text is not clear, any reader or interpreter would look the word up in a dictionary to make sense of the word. The laws are made for the public. Note that and, and are supposed to contain words and terms understandable by the general members of the public. But there is another reason for this rule to be applied. And that comes under the heading of application of judicial restraint. And what is that judicial restraint? Again, taking its literal meaning, stop something, restrain something, limit something. So how is that done? Well, the judges are supposed to be the interpreters of the legislation, not the makers of law. Although many argue, well, they make law as well, but they are not supposed to make law. They are only inter of the legislation. They are supposed to implement the intention of the parliament. They need to make sure that they do not add or take anything away from the legislation passed by the people's representatives. This is the limitation that the judges put on themselves to make sure that they keep their role limited to the interpreters of the law. However, Following literal rules strictly may cause issues with the interpretation of statutes. Uh, let's look at an example. In the case of Whiteley and Chapel 1868 case, the defendant in this case pretended to be someone who was on the voters list and had died. The defendant was charged with the offence of impersonating a person entitled to vote. In this case, the defendant was found not guilty. The court applied a literal rule in this case and held that a dead person is not a person entitled to vote. Hence, the offence cannot be made out for impersonating a dead person. Excellent example. If we look at the possible intention of the parliament in such cases, clearly the intention of the parliament would be to stop people casting bogus votes and not whether the person who was being impersonated was dead or alive. However, taking the literal rule approach, the wording is clear that the person being impersonated should be a person entitled to vote. In the case of R against Judge of the City of London Court, 1892, Lord Escher M.R supported the literal rule in the following words. If the words of an act are clear, then you must follow them, even though they lead to a manifest absurdity. The view seems to be encouraging to limit the approach of the judges in interpreting the statutes. Lord Diplock's statement in the case of Duport Steele's Limited against Sirs, 1980, or a recent case, comparatively, the case reflects the rationale behind this approach and it states if this be the case it is for parliament not for the judiciary to decide whether any changes should be made to the law as stated in the acts clear let's look at two more popular examples london and north eastern railway and barryman 1946 case and then we look at the case of partridge and Crittenden, um, a famous contract law case First, in the case of London and North Eastern Railway and Berryman, our railway worker was killed in an accident whilst he was oiling the railway track. The law provided for compensation payable on death for those who were, in commas, relaying or repairing the railway track. Remember that problem that we discussed when judges or lawyers might face while interpreting the statutes and the laws. This is a fine example of that. According to the literal rule, relaying or repairing did not mean oiling. It's either relay or repair. There was no ambiguity in the words, hence it was not possible for the court to extend the meaning despite the result of such ruling being harsh. The claim of the widow was unsuccessful in this case, simply because the words were limited in their meaning, relaying or repairing, could not have meant oiling. Let's look at now the second example of Partridge and Crittenden 1968 case, where the defendant advertised for sale a number of wild birds, 
the price was advertised to be 25 shillings, as it was for each. According to the Protection of Birds Act 1954, it was unlawful to offer, in commas, any wild live bird for sale. The defendants were found not guilty because the advertised price was only an invitation to treat and not an offer for sale. Since there was clear difference between the invitation to treat and an offer, the court applied literal meaning of the law. The court further clarified that the legislature had chosen the phrase offer for sale based on its existing understanding and to change this understanding was not proper for the court. I hope you understand what the literal rule means and how it is has been applied by the courts. There are quizzes and exercises which you can utilize to cement your understanding. The quizzes are given um, at the end of this course. Let's look at our next lecture which is on the golden rule. Our next rule of construction is the golden rule. This rule can be stated as follows. Where the words have two or more meanings in any given legislation, they should be given their plain and ordinary meaning unless any such meanings produce absurdity or repugnant consequences. In such a case, the meaning that is not absurd will be preferred to the one which may be absurd. Sounds simple, but let's see how simple is this. Despite the literal rule and the judiciary's will to limit itself to the plain wording of any enactment, there may be the cases where avoiding manifest absurdity may only be in consistence with the parliamentary instruments and enactments under the consideration of the court. The gold rule does not go beyond avoiding absurdity or inconsistency with the enactment and is an adaptation of the literal rule in a way. The rule simply allows the courts to prefer a sensible meaning, a more sensible meaning, to an absurd meaning where the word or term carries both meanings. The golden rule has been stated in the case of Gray against Pearson, 1857, in the following words. The grammatical and ordinary sense of the words is to be adhered to, unless that would lead to some absurdity or some repugnance or inconsistency with the rest of the instrument, in which case the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words may be modified, so as to avoid that absurdity and inconsistency, but no farther, per Lord Wensleydale. In another case of Jones against Director of Public Prosecutions in 1962, to Lord Reed stated, It is a cardinal principle in all statutes that you may not attach to a statutory provision a meaning that the words of that provision cannot reasonably bear. If they are capable of more than one meaning, then you can choose between those meanings, but beyond that you must not go. In the case of Kurtz and Cow against Inland Revenue Commissioners, Lord Reed stated where a statutory provision on one interpretation brings about a startling and inadequate result, this may lead the court to seek another possible interpretation which will do better justice. Lord Reed on another occasion in the case of Luke against Inland Revenue Commissioner stated the same point as follows. It is only where the words are absolutely incapable of a construction which will accord with the apparent intention of the provision and will avoid a wholly unreasonable result that the words of the enactment must prevail. So in light of all these decisions, we are going to see how the interpretation of the golden rule is carried out. In view of the statement by Lord Reed in Jones against DPP. Golden Rule has been frequently interpreted narrowly. However, given the approach of the court in departing from the literal rule, the Golden Rule has been interpreted in a narrow as well in a slightly wider sense, really depending upon the needs of the circumstances. Let's look at some examples of the Golden Rule applied by the courts in different cases. First case, R against Allen, 1872 case. The relevant section 
uh, for the interpretation purposes is section 57 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, which reads as follows, Whosoever being married shall marry any other person during the lifetime of his spouse shall commit the offence of bigamy. If we look at the literal meaning of the words used in this section, it is impossible for a married person to marry. If someone is legally married, he or she cannot ever commit this offence, ever. However, the judges interpreted the word marry in the following sense. That is, to go through the ceremony of marriage. Cases of Jones against DPP and R against Allen were examples of the narrow application of the Golden Rule. In both cases, please revisit if you need to. The words had more than one meaning and one of the meaning was applied. Following are the examples of the application of the golden rule in a wider sense. Case of Adler against George, 1964. In this case, the defendant had obstructed a member of Her Majesty's forces whilst he was inside the Merham Royal Air Force Station. Section 3 of the Official Secrets Act 1920 stated that a person will be guilty of the offence of obstruction if it takes place in the vicinity of any prohibited place. The defendant sought to use the literal meaning of the legislation to avoid being guilty of an offence. He argued that he could only be held guilty of an offence if he would be in the vicinity of the place. He argued that he was on the station itself when the incident took place and that he could not be said to be in the vicinity of the place. The defendant was convicted in this case as the courts decided that the Royal Air Force Station was included in the wording of in the vicinity of any prohibited place. The defendant was on the base and in the vicinity includes on or near the station. Another example, Re Sigworth, 1935, in this case, a son had murdered his mother. According to the law, the son would have inherited his mother's residuary estate under the intestacy rules and in the absence of any will made by the deceased. The relevant law, that is section 46 of the Administration of Estates Act 1925, had no ambiguity in that the son would be entitled to the estate as an issue of his mother. Issue is a technical term for the inheritors, like son or daughter. However, the court held that since the son had murdered the mother, he should not have been entitled to her estate as this would produce obnoxious results. It can be said that the court in this case effectively extended the meaning of the legislation by excluding the murderers of the state owners from their entitlement to the inheritance of the residuary states. Here is another example of the application of golden rule where the statutes have been interpreted to resolve obvious drafting errors. In the case of Inco Europe Limited against First Choice Distribution, the House of Lords, now Supreme Court, had allowed for the words to be added to statutes in order to resolve obvious drafting errors. Lord Nichols stated the court must be able to correct obvious drafting errors. In suitable cases, in discharging its interpretative function, the court will add words or omit words or substitute words. This power is confined to plain cases of drafting mistakes. The courts are ever mindful that their constitutional role in this field is interpretative. They must abstain from any course which might have the appearance of judicial legislation. A statute is expressed in language approved and enacted by the legislature. In this case, the Arbitration Act 1996 did not contain a right of appeal from the High Court to the Court of Appeal. The Court added this right to Section 9 of the 1996 Act. We will now look at the Mischief Rule. See you in the next lecture. We will now look at the Mischief Rule. The Mischief Rule is also known as the Rule in Hayden's case.
According to this rule, the courts ascertain the intention of the parliament behind the legislation under consideration. The courts consider what was the mischief that the parliament aimed to remedy. The courts ascertain this in light of the following four principles laid down in the Hayden's case, 1584. Principle number one, what was the common law before the making of the statute? Principle number two, what was the mischief and defect for which the common law did not provide? Principle number three, what remedy did the parliament propose to cure the disease? And the fourth principle is the true reason of the remedy. The courts are always to make such construction as shall suppress the mischief and advance the remedy and to suppress subtle inventions and evasions for continuance of the mischief and to add force and life to the cure and remedy according to the true intent of the makers of the act. This rule is used widely and the rationale behind this is reflected in the following statement of Lord Radcliffe in AG for Canada against Halian and Carey Limited. Courts of law have resorted to different rules of construction in their interpretation of statutes but the paramount rule remains that every statute is to be expounded according to its manifest and expressed intention. Since there is always a reason and rationale behind every enactment passed by the legislature, this rule can be applied to any law, wherever literal and golden rules failed to achieve the purpose of the legislation. In the case of River Ware Commissioners and Adamson, Lord Blackburn said, in all cases, the object is to see what is the intention expressed by the words used. But from the imperfection of language, it is impossible to know what that intention is without inquiring further and seeing what the circumstances were with reference to which the words were used and what was the object appearing from those circumstances which the person using them had in view. The more important reason why the literal and golden rules may be considered before this rule is applied is because the courts may have to take painstaking exercise to find out the intention of the parliament in the case of mischief rule. Now let's look at some of the examples of the cases where this rule was applied. Number one, Corkery and Carpenter, 1951. Now this is the case where the defendant was riding a bicycle whilst under the influence of alcohol. Under section 12 of the Licensing Act 1872, it was an offence to be drunk while in charge on any highway of any carriage, horse, cattle or steam engine. The court held that the act was to be read purposively. Lord Goddard, CJ ruled, for this purpose there cannot be any distinction between a section in a highway statute passed for the protection of the public and a section in a licensing statute passed for the same purpose, both of them concerning the conduct of a person on the highway and the preservation of public order. And a bicycle is a carriage. It is a carriage, in my opinion, because it carries. The mischief intended to be addressed was drunks on the highway being in charge of transport. The court applied the mischief rule holding that riding a bicycle on the highway under the influence of alcohol was within the mischiefs the act proposed to remedy. As such, the defendant represented a danger to himself and other road users and was held guilty. Example of are against Westminster Magistrates Court. It's 2011. Relatively recent case, the United Kingdom Independence Party had accepted donations from an individual whose name was not listed on the electoral register through inadvertence. Party could have received donations only from those persons whose names were on the electoral register. The Electoral Commission sought to impose a forfeit of an equal amount under Section 58.2 of the Political Parties Elections and Referendums Act 2000, which reads, the court may, on an application made by the Commission, order the forfeiture by the party of an amount equal to the value of the donation. The Court of Appeal applied the literal approach and ordered the party to repay the whole of the donated amount. On appeal, the Supreme Court held that the mischief intended to be remedied was to prevent foreign donors from funding UK political party. The mischief had not occurred. The Parliament imposed a requirement that the name be on the register. 
However, there was no presumption in favor of any such forfeiture and property rights should not be interfered with except where such an intention is shown clearly. The case of Smith and Hughes. In this case, the defendants were prostitutes who had been charged under the Street Offences Act 1959. The act made it an offence to solicit in a street or public place. The prostitutes were soliciting from private premises on balconies or in windows so could be seen by the passers-by. The court applied the mischief rule, holding that the activities of the defendants were within the mischief the act was aimed at. The mischief Parliament intended to remedy was soliciting people on the street, even though the prostitute was not in the street herself. The act should be interpreted to include this activity using the mischief rule. Lord Parker stated that the aim of the act was to clean up the streets to enable people to walk along the streets without being molested or solicited by common prostitutes. If the court had applied literal rule, the prostitutes would have been acquitted since they were not soliciting in a street or public place. They were within the premises of their private properties. Let's look at, at another example. Royal College of Nursing and DHSS. The Offences Against the Person Act 1861 made it an offence for any person to carry out an abortion. The Abortion Act 1961 provided that it would be an absolute defence for a medically registered practitioner to carry out abortions, provided certain conditions were satisfied. Nurses were not registered medical practitioners. However, it was common for the abortions to be administered by nurses. The Royal College of Nursing disputed a Department of Health and Social Security statement that it was not an offence under Britain's 1967 Abortion Act for nurses to terminate a pregnancy by medical induction if a doctor decided on the termination, initiated it and remained responsible for it. The House of Lords, as it then was, ruled that since the intent of the 1967 Act was to broaden the grounds on which abortions might be lawfully and safely obtained as part of ordinary medical care, nurses participating in pregnancy termination were protected under the Act, provided that a physician prescribed the treatment, remained in charge and accepted responsibility throughout the procedure. It was a controversial decision with Lords Wilberforce and Edmund Davies claiming that the House was rewriting the legislation and not just interpreting it. This is the end of our construction rules. We have learned the literal rule, the golden rule and the mischief rule in this section. Please go to quizzes. The link would have been given uh, in under one of these videos. Follow the link and you can access the quizzes for free. Let's move on to our next section which is language rules. See you in the next lecture. We are now going to look at the rules of language. The rules of language, as, as, as we will look at them, Noskita, Osakias, for example, or Ayusdam Generis, these rules are not rules in the strict legal sense. Just like the rules of construction, for example, the go golden rule uh, we just learned, they are principles of interpreting parliamentary legislation. The courts are free to apply or depart from these rules depending upon the approach that they take to interpreting the legislation under consideration. Please note that when courts take different approaches to the interpretation of the law, they usually do not make it clear which approach they took to interpret the certain piece of legislation. However, this is usually obvious if you read the case and how the court has come to the conclusion. Again, it is not necessary that the courts will always make it clear or at least make a reference to that. The judges may use different rules of language and construction within the same case and for different parts of legislation within the same statute. The rules of statutory interpretation were analyzed by Professor John Willis in his 1938 article Statutory Interpretation in a Nutshell, 1938 book. He suggested that a court invokes whichever of the rules produces a result that satisfies its sense of justice in the case before it. Although 
it goes on to say the literal rule is the one most frequently referred to in express terms the courts treat all three as valid and refer to them as occasion demands but naturally enough do not assign any reason for choosing one rather than another I do not think that this can be simplified more than that let's look at the rules of language starting with noskita osokius see you in the next lecture in this lecture we are going to learn about noskita osokius or nosita osokius there are two ways to pronounce this rule literally this word means known by the company it keeps this means that the meanings of the words can be recognized and derived in light of the words around a specific word. In English, this can be described as the rule of recognition or determination by the associated or related words. The words must be interpreted in the context of the words around them. In the case of Bourne against Norwich Crematorium Limited, Stamp J stated that words derive color from those which surround them. Beautiful description. Sentences are not mere collections of words to be taken out of the sentence, defined separately by reference to the dictionary or decided cases, and then put back again into the sentence with the meaning which one has assigned to them as separate words, so as to give the sentence or phrase a meaning which, as a sentence or phrase, it cannot bear without distortion of the English language. Stamp J then goes on to state that one must construe a word or phrase in a section of an act of parliament with all the assistance one can from decided cases, and if you will, from the dictionary, is not in doubt. But having obtained all that assistance, one must not at the end of the day distort that which has to be construed and give it a meaning which in its context one would not think it can possibly bear. Let's look at the example of a case in which this rule was applied. Pengali against Bell Punch Company Limited 1964 case. This rule was applied in this case to interpret a provision in the Factories Act 1961. The act required that all floors, steps, stairs, passageways and gangways had to be kept free from obstruction. In this case, the court had to decide whether a floor used for storage was covered under the 1961 Act. The court held that since all the other words indicated passageway, a floor that was used exclusively for storage did not come under the Act. These are some of the beautiful ways in which the statutes are interpreted. Let's look at another example. And please, I have to say that again, do not forget to undertake exercises and quizzes to help support your learning. Another example of a case in which this rule was applied is Inland Revenue Commissioners and Freer. Uh, the Income Tax Act 1958 allowed the amount of interest annuities or other annual interest to be deducted from the income. The respondent in this case uh, had taken out a short-term loan and paid interest on that loan. For tax assessment liability purposes, he sought to deduct the interest that he was liable to pay on the short-term loan. As per the Nosita Associates, or Nosketer Osokius rule, the mentioned amounts of interest related only to annual payments. Since the interest paid by the respondent on the short-term loan was not an annual interest payment, he could not deduct it from his income and was therefore liable to pay tax on it. Another example of Muir against Kie, 1875 case, where the court considered the Refreshment Houses Act 1860, which dealt with public refreshment, resort and entertainment and the licensing of premises. The defendant was running a business under the name The Cafe. It was found to be open through the night and at one time, 17 women and 20 men were present at the business premises. The cafe sold them cigars, coffee and ginger beer, which they were consuming in the premises. Court held that the house was kept open for public refreshment, resort and entertainment and as such required a license. The defendant argued that since he did not provide entertainment, he did not need a license. The court was of the view, though, that the entertainment does not need to be musical. 
reception and accommodation etc of the people may also come under entertainment requiring license so really this case broadens the scope uh, of the licensing um, in this case now that we have learned about the rule of noscita asocius that is uh, the word it, as it means known by the company it keeps i hope you have found this lecture useful please undertake some exercises the link has been given either at the end of this course or below this video you can also undertake quizzes to support your learning let's go on to our next lecture and learn about aesdem generis and what that means in this lecture, we are going to learn about the word aestum generis and what it means. The term aestum generis means of the same kind. General words following specific words normally apply only to such things or persons which are of the same kind or class as the specific ones. The rule provides that the general words are restricted in their meaning to the same kinds of persons and things as mentioned in the specific words laid down in the list. As an example, if a statute applied to mobile phones, tablets, ebook readers and other devices in commas, it could be assumed that a PDA, personal digital assistant, would be included as other devices, but not a desktop computer. The rule takes a contextual approach and refers to words and phrases of the same class or genus of things. In the case of R against Edmondson, it was stated by Lord Campbell that where there were general words following particular and specific words, the general words must be confined to things of the same kind as those specified. Application of this rule limits the ambit of wider expressions and the intention of the legislature is given effect. Let's look at different uh, examples of the application of this rule. First is the case of Powell against Campton Park race course. A statutory provision in the Batting Act 1853 laid down that batting was illegal in a comma, house, office, room, or other place. Comma closed. The question before the House of Lords was whether Tattersall's ring at Campton Park race course fell within the meaning of other place. Applying the rules of aestum generis, the house decided that the general words had to mean an indoor place, as the other words in the list were all references to inside places. The Tattersall's ring was held not to be other place falling under the relevant provision, as it was an outdoor place. So this is how this rule works. It looks around of the same kind. It should not be applied on something which is not of the same kind or is of a different kind. Another example would be Allen and Emerson. In this case, the court was asked to consider if funfair was included in the phrase theatre or the place of public entertainment. The court held that for the Aeusdem generis rule to apply, there had to be at least two specific words in the list before the more general word or phrase. Accordingly, the phrase did include a funfair, though it was not of the same kind as theatres. The case of Wood and Commissioner of Police of the Metropolis illustrated the difficulties of interpretation under this rule. Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act 1824 defined offensive weapon as any gun, pistol, hanger, cutlass, bulletin, or other offensive weapon. The defendant used a piece of broken glass as a weapon and was charged under this act. The court held that the broken glass was not an offensive weapon under the act as it was not made or adapted for causing injury to a person. The fact that an atom may have potential for any such use is not sufficient for the item to be classified as an offensive weapon under this law. An interesting case illustrating this rule is R against Kensington and Chelsea LBC. Um, Section 59 of the Housing Act 1985 gave priority for the purposes of housing and benefits to those who are vulnerable as a result of old age, mental illness or handicap or physical disability, or other special reason. Four asylum seekers facing extreme financial hardship had been deprived of benefits. 
they sought housing assistance from the authority on the basis that they were covered by the other special reason under the relevant provision. The court held that the asylum seekers were entitled to benefits and housing as such destitution was capable of being other special reason within the act despite the statute referring to physical and mental needs. The appeal against the refusal of the assistance was allowed. Personally, I mean, I would disagree with this case, but there you are. Justice was served with this interpretation. So what is then the difference between a justum generis and noscitor socius? This can be stated as follows. The justum generis rule that we just learned is used for a list containing general words, whereas noscitor socius is used for particular words and the comparison of that in a piece of legislation. I hope these two rules of language uh, has been clarified. We will now look at the third rule, expresso unius est excluso alterius. See you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to learn about the expression expressio unius est exclusio alterius. The expression means to express one is to exclude others. Mentioning of one or more particular things may be taken to exclude others of the same kind. To make sense of the sentence in general English, this can be described as expressing one thing excludes another, which is not referred to. The effect of this rule means that if a list of specific words is not followed by general words, the act only applies in relation to the words given in the list. As an example, if a statute refers to mobile phones and e-book readers, they may not include notebooks. In the case of R against inhabitants of Sedgley, the poor relief Act 1601 levied taxes on lands, houses and coal mines in Karma. The court considered whether the taxes could be levied on owners of limestone mines. The court held that the act did not apply to limestone mines as these were not specifically mentioned. Moreover, the statute did not suggest that it would apply to other types of mines. Here is an example of the case where literal interpretation of the words resulted in absurd and obnoxious conclusion. A statute made it an offence to in commas, stab, cut or wound another person. In R against Harris, the defendant first bit a friend's nose in a fight and then bit a policeman's finger. The court held that the statute pointed towards the interpretation that the wounding should be inflicted with some instrument and not by teeth. The defendant was found not guilty. Despite the absurdity of the result, such decisions result in the enactment of better laws in Parliament. We do need to keep this in mind that the judges are only the interpreter of laws and cannot rewrite parliamentary legislation. Looking at these types of cases, these cases prove that the judiciary is simply interpreting the laws. Another example, Tempest against Kilner, the the statute of fraud 1677 required contracts for the sale of goods, wares and merchandise to be evidenced in writing where they were over a specified value. The court construed whether the statute applied to the sale of stocks and shares. The court held that stocks and shares were not covered by the statute as the specific words goods, wares and merchandise were not followed by general words. Application of this rule can be found in the relatively recent case of R against Secretary of State for the Home Department. In this case, the rule was used to exclude the father of an illegitimate child from rights under the relevant immigration laws. The applicant was born in Hong Kong to a Chinese mother. The father was English. The applicant applied for entry clearance to the United Kingdom as a student. Her intention was to reside in the UK permanently on the basis that her father was a British citizen. The application was refused on the ground that as an illegitimate child she had no claim under the Immigration Act 1971. The word parent within the meaning of Section 23A of the Immigration Act 1971 did not include the father of an illegitimate child. The court held that the definitions section mentioned the mother alone. This is the end of our lecture. Please do not forget to undertake exercises and quizzes, the link of which is given either under this video or at the end of this course. Thank you. In the next section, 
we are going to learn about different interpretation approaches. In this lecture we are going to look at different interpretation approaches. As you will see these approaches are mainly based on the European Union law and after the Brexit although there won't be further influence of the law but a separate European jurisprudence has become part of the UK and, and has developed uh, over some period of time so we can probably in the near future the statutes will be interpreted along the same lines and this approach will still be relevant. This approach is widely used in European law and has overtaken the mischief rule to a large extent. It is sometimes similar to the mischief rule however purposive approach goes wider than mere ascertaining and considering the mischief. According to this rule the judges look at the purpose of the enactment for which it was passed. Even this means distorting the plain meanings of the words. And that is something that is unique to the European Union law and changed the landscape of the interpretation of statutes in the UK. In practice this approach is not limited to the interpretation of the European Union law and the judges take this approach in interpreting any piece of parliamentary enactment. It, it, it can be said that the purpose of approach is increasingly superseding the literal rule and the mischief rule as the appropriate approach to ascertain the will of the legislature. In the case of R against Secretary of State for the Environment, Transport and the Regions, Expert Spath Home Limited, Lord Nicholas of Birken had stated that nowadays the courts look at external aid for more than merely identifying the mischief the statute is intended to cure. In adopting a purposive approach to the interpretation of statutory language, courts seek to identify and give effect to the purpose of the legislation to the extent that extraneous material assists in identifying the purpose of the legislation. It's a useful tool. Lord Denning in the case of Northam against London Borough of Barnet referred to this approach that will promote the general legislative purpose underlying the provisions. Lord Scarman stated in the case of R against Barnet that the purpose of approach should only be taken if the courts can find in the statute read as a whole or in material to which they are permitted by law to refer as aids to interpretation and expression of Parliament's purpose or policy. In the case of Pepper, Inspector of Taxes against Hart, Lord Brown Wilkinson appreciated that the purpose of approach to construction now adopted by the courts in order to give effect to the true intentions of the legislature. Lord Griffiths also supported this view and stated that the days have long passed when the courts adopted a strict constructionist view of interpretation which required them to adopt the literal meaning of the language. The courts now adopt a purposive approach which seek to give effect to the true purpose of legislation and are prepared to look at much extraneous material that bears upon the background against which the legislation was enacted. Back in 1969, the Law Commission report had also proposed for the UK courts to adopt a purposive approach. In practice, we will see that this approach will still be undertaken by the UK judges in interpreting the parliamentary enactments. While we are discussing this purpose of approach and as just at the start of this lecture we discussed that this has overtaken to some extent the mischief rule, there is a difference still between purpose of approach and the mischief rule. We are going to understand the difference between mischief rule and purpose of approach by this diagram. As you can see, the mischief rule goes back to look at the background of the legislation, what was the intention of the legislature in the past. On the other hand, when we look at purposive approach, this looks towards the aims which are to be achieved in future and this has been borrowed from the European Union law. As we learned, purposive approach has become far wider than the mischief rule. Purposive approach looks at the purpose and the social impacts of the legislation. The mischief rule supposes that the intent of the legislature in passing any enactment was to remedy a certain mischief. And then this goes back to the past. And look at the background. If you want to refresh 
your understanding of mischief rule or perhaps if approached please go back to the lecture of um, rules of construction. In the next lecture we will learn about the EC legislation in the context of statutory interpretation. In this lecture we will look at the EC legislation um, and its impact on the rules of interpretation in the UK. Under the European Communities Act 1972, the UK courts are bound, well I, I'm going to use no were, were bound to interpret the legislation to implement the EC law. European jurisdiction is a civil law jurisdiction which does not take exhaustive approach unlike the legislation in the UK. Drafting in the civil law jurisprudence and jurisdictions is comparatively simple with a considerable degree of abstractions. When interpreting the EC law, the UK courts have to take similar approach as to the EU courts to give effect to the EC le legislation. Since the UK legislation should also be in conformity, should have been, with the EC legislation, the UK courts take the same approach for the UK legislation. And remember, the purpose of this lecture in relation to EC legislation remains relevant because as we um, discussed in one of our earlier lectures, that this is going to be the nature of interpretation uh, for the foreseeable future unless it is changed by an enactment of the Parliament. Taking the approach um, in relation to conformity with EC legislation, this inevitably results in the UK courts taking purposive approach more widely. This should also be noted that the decision of the European Court of Justice are binding, were binding in the UK and have been influencing the UK legal system and the approaches taken by the courts to the interpretation of the legislation. The case of Lister, for example, against fourth dry dock and engineering is an example that the domestic legislation must be interpreted in line with the EC law. And that's how this jurisprudence developed. In this case, the relevant legislation was the transfer of undertakings, Protection of Employment Regulations 1981. This was a statutory instrument, a form of delegated legislation which had implemented an EC directive. In this case, the company's 12 employees were dismissed an hour before the business was transferred to a new owner. The employees were intended to be replaced by a group of employees who were prepared to work for lower salaries. The employees claimed unfair dismissal. The relevant law provided that the transfer shall not terminate the contract of any person employed immediately before the transfer. The question for the court was to decide whether the employees could be considered to have been in employment immediately before the transfer when they had been dismissed one hour prior to the transfer. The House of Lords held that the employees would have been so employed if they had not been unfairly dismissed before the transfer. And this is my area of specialization as well. The House had clearly read in the additional words in the legislation to give the effect to and achieve the purpose of the EC directive. The aim of the legislation was to protect the employees in the case of a transfer of business. Another example, Pickstone against Freeman's PLC. Miss Pickstone, the claimant in this case, was working as a warehouse operative. She claimed that her work was of equal value to that done by the male colleagues who were being paid £1.22 pence per week more than her. The House of Lords applied the purposive approach and ruled that Miss Pickstone was entitled to make a claim on the basis of work of equal value even though there was a male employee doing the same work as her. According to the court, the literal approach would have left the UK in breach of its treaty obligations to give effect to an EU directive. Recently, you might have heard in the UK that equal pay claim in respect of this claim, there have been flurry of cases and a huge amount of legislation in relation to equal pay is still going through employment tribunals in the UK. Now let's look at the impact of Human Rights Act on interpretation in our next lecture. The Human Rights Act 1998 brought into force European Convention on Human Rights in the past. We are expecting that after the Brexit there, there might be some changes to Human Rights Act. Let's discuss the impact of Human Rights Act on interpretation as long as it is in force. Section 3 of the Human Rights Act 1998 reads as follows. 
So far as it is possible to do so, primary and subordinate legislation must be read and given effect in a way which is compatible with the Convention rights. If it is not possible for the courts to give effect in a way which is compatible with the Convention rights, the courts may make a declaration of incompatibility in respect of the relevant legislation. The effects of Section 3 of the 1998 Act was considered in the following case. R against A, 2001. The defendant was charged with rape. In his defense, the defendant claimed that the complainant had consented to the sexual intercourse. The defendant sought leave under Section 41 of the Youth, Justice and Criminal Evidence Act 1999 to question the complainant about her sexual behaviour. Section 41 sets out the circumstances in which a defendant may question the victim in the witness box. Section 41 3b prohibited a defendant from questioning the victim unless the issue involved was that the victim consented to sex and the sexual behavior of the complainant to which the evidence or question relates is alleged to have taken place at or about the same time as the event which is the subject matter of the charge against the accused. The defendant argued that Section 3 of the Human Rights Act 1998 required the court to consider Section 41 in accordance with Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights and not allowing him to question the complainant deprived him of a fair trial under Article 6. The House of Lords held that Section 41 of the 1999 Act should be construed where necessary by having regard to the interpretative obligation under Section 3 of the Human Rights Act. Accordingly, the appropriate approach would be whether the evidence to be obtained by questioning the victim would be so relevant to the issue of consent that to exclude this would breach the defendant's right to fair trial under Article 6. The House held that this was not the case in this case. Remember, all cases are decided, considered, construed upon uh, according to their particular facts. In this case, the House decided this wasn't the case. The defendant failed in this case. However, the case provides an important example of how the courts are prepared to give the legislation different meaning under the Human Rights Act 1998 from the one intended by Parliament. We are now going to discuss briefly Brexit and statutory interpretation in our next lecture. Brexit and statutory interpretation. The people of Britain voted to leave the European Union on June 23rd, 2016. One of the important issues from the statutory interpretation view is whether the courts will alter their approach to interpreting the laws in the post-Brexit era. On the other hand, we need to keep in mind that since the accession of the UK with the EU, a separate EU law-based jurisprudence has developed and has become a major part of the UK legal system. It can be safely said that the purposive approach will continue to be used. However, Given the nature of the UK legislation, the courts may not need to look at the legislation from as wide a point of view as they had looked at the legislation originated in the EU. In the post-Brexit era, any rights and obligations that flowed from the EU treaties are going to go away, except the ones which are already passed into statutes, or unless Parliament enacts the laws to make them part of the UK legal system. In other words, bringing about constitutional changes on a large and drastic scale within the UK legal system. The European Court of Justice rulings may not be binding on the UK courts and the UK courts may have no need to follow the precedents. This applies to both the higher as well as the lower UK courts. This means that the statutory interpretation may get a complete overhaul in the post-Brexit era. In the circumstances, we can only wait and see how the UK legal system is going to be refined and developed as a result of the changes ahead. Let's go on to our next section, Aids to Interpretation, where we are going to learn about intrinsic aids and extrinsic aids. See you in the next section. In this section, we are going to learn about aids to interpretation. In addition to the different rules of construction and language, the courts may use different aids to interpret a statute 
These aids may be available within the piece of relevant legislation or may be outside sources and materials. They are respectively called internal or intrinsic aids and external or extrinsic aids. Examples of intrinsic aids may be short title of the statute, for example, preamble, section headings and grammatical usage, something which is found within the Act. These aids are found within the statutes or the relevant piece of legislation, for example, Theft Act 1968, anything within the Act that will be internal or intrinsic aid. Examples of extrinsic aids may include law commission reports, for example, Hansard, that's record of parliamentary speeches, textbooks, journal articles, and dictionaries. We will look at these aids separately, but let's start with intrinsic aids in this section. Any statutory words and terms that have been subject to the parliamentary debates are useful and legitimate aids. Such aids may include long and short titles of the statutes, headings, preambles, and punctuations. Apart from the above, the statutes may also contain marginal notes. Sometimes they seem to be explaining some term within the statute and may be considered as an aid to interpret statutes. However, you need to be aware that marginal notes are not debated in the parliament and are normally not used by the courts for interpreting statutes. Some controversy, however, does exist in relation to the relevance of the marginal notes for statutory interpretation. Please refer to the introductory section to remind yourself of the structure of statute. Let's discuss the intrinsic aids below. Number one, long title. Long title is considered as an aid to interpretation, as among others. It gives some information about the purposes of the act. In the case of Black Clausen International Limited um, against Pia Werke, um, Lord Simon stated that the statutory objective is primarily to be collected from the provisions of the statute itself. In these days, when the long title can be amended in both houses, I can see no reason for having recourse to it only in case of an ambiguity. It is the plainest of all the guides to the general objectives of a statute. In the case of Royal College of Nursing of the UK against DHSS, four out of the five law lords refer to the long title of the Abortion Act 1967. This shows the importance of the long title in interpreting the statutes. Next, intrinsic aid is short title. There is some controversy in relation to whether the short title can be used to resolve any ambiguity in the interpretation of a statute, but it remains an intrinsic aid. Preamble. It's mainly found in old statutes. Preamble means to walk before. This part used to come before the body of the statutes. This usually contained objectives and purposes of the acts, including indication of the mischief to be remedied, and is a useful aid to interpretation. Preamble was stated to be relevant in considering purpose of statutory instrument in Vibixia Limited and Komori Yuka Limited. It was also stated in another case of R against the Corporation of London that preamble is no more than a guide to Parliament's intention, but it is a guide. Then there is a definition section. Statutes may contain definition sections at the start or towards the end of a statute. Usually the words are expressly defined in the definition sections and may refer to other statutes on the similar subject or area of legislation. The words are given special meaning in such sections to give effect to the parliamentary intention and are of fundamental importance to interpret the related statutes. For example, in the road traffic New Drivers Act 1995 section 9 states that the word notice in the act means notice in writing. This means that a verbal notice may not be a valid notice under the act. So hence meaning of the word notice in this statute will only be notice in writing. Another example is section 5.2 of the Animal Boarding Establishments Act 1963 which defined animal as any dog or cat. This means cow is not considered as an animal under this act. Hence there is a difference between 
legal English and normal English. Legal English is not confined to special meaning, but it has been further defined in case law by statutes and one word may contain more than one meaning in different statutes. Marginal notes. Chandler against DPP, the court held in this case that the word espionage in section 1 of the Official Secrets Act 1911 includes sabotage. The marginal notes of the statutes refer to spying. The court ignored the notes and the word spying was not used to interpret the statutory words. That's how intrinsic aids are treated depending upon their nature. Explanatory notes. Explanatory notes are used by the courts to seek assistance in the interpretation of statutes. In the case of R.S. against Chief Constable of South Yorkshire, Lord Stein stated that insofar as the explanatory notes cast light on the setting of a statute and the mischief at which it is aimed, they are always admissible aids to construction. He further added that they may contain much more immediate and valuable material than other aids used by the courts. In the case of R against A, Lord Hope stated that it is legitimate to refer to the explanatory notes to the Act prepared by the Home Office for the purpose of clarification. He stated that he would use the explanatory notes in the same way as he would use the explanatory notes attached to a statutory instrument. Another aid is section headings and side notes. This has been stated in are against Montilla that section headings and side notes are admissible aids to construction. Punctuations. Punctuation can be considered for statutory interpretation as it is expected that expert draftsmen have used them for a reason. Lord Lowry stated in the case of Hanlon against Law Society to ignore punctuation disregards the reality that literate people such as parliamentary draftsmen do punctuate what they write. Punctuation is very important and as we stated in our introductory lecture that an Oxford comma made a big difference to a case in the United States. Schedules. They can be absolutely necessary aid to the interpretation. Hunting Act 2004 provides exemptions in its schedule. One, for example, if hunting is within a class specified in that schedule. Some schedule may contain definitions of different words used in the statute. Some schedules may refer to other statutes and acts for further explanation. In the next lecture, we will look at extrinsic aids. See you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to look at extrinsic aids. Extrinsic aids are the aids which are available to the courts to help interpret statutes from outside sources and resources. Let's look at them one by one. Number one, always on the top, dictionaries. They can be used to give words their plain meaning and are helpful to courts when using literal approach, since they are looking at the literal meaning of the word. In the case of Regina against Falling, the police obtained an interview from the defendant by stating to defendant that her lover had been having an affair. This caused distress to the defendant and she made admissions to the police. The defendant took the plea that the interview was obtained through oppression. The court used the dictionary meaning of the oppression stating that here oppression means the exercise of authority or power in a burdensome, harsh or wrongful manner. Unjust or cruel treatment of subjects, unfairness, etc. or the imposition of unreasonable or unjust burdens. Interpretation statutes or acts. Interpretation acts are found in almost all jurisdictions. In the UK, the Interpretation Act 1978. In some jurisdictions, there is General Clauses Act. In UK, the 1978 Act gives specific definitions to the words which are commonly used in legislation. As a fundamental example, the Act states that the masculine includes the feminine and the singular includes the plural unless stated otherwise. White Papers In the case of R on the application of W against Commissioner of Police for the Metropolis and another, the court referred to paragraph 5.8 of the government White Paper. No more excuses. A new approach to tackling youth crime in England and Wales to address the construction issues in relation to Part 4 of the Anti-Social Behaviour Act 2003. The court appeared to be looking for the intention of the Parliament and stated that the relevant laws are intended to provide an effective, immediate method of dealing with 
clearly identified problems of antisocial and disorderly children who are too young to be left out unsupervised at night. Committee reports. Reports of special committees can be used in a limited way. For example, in the case of R against Allen, reference was made to the 13th report of the Criminal Law Revision Committee report when considering the offence of making off without payment contrary to Section 3 of the Theft Act 1978. However, it was made clear that the report was used only to recognise the mischief the Parliament aimed to avoid and not to interpret the meaning of the statute. Then there are academic commentaries and journal articles written by the leading academicians may be considered by the courts. For example, in the case of Regina against Shivpuri, the House of Lords acknowledged academic argument relevant to the issue in question. Official reports. Prior to a certain piece of legislation, there may be reports of different commissions, for example, the Law Commission, the Royal Commission, or any special commission formed for related purposes. The courts may use such material as an aid to understand the mischief the Parliament aimed to remedy. However, in the case of Black Clawson International Limited, as we learnt about this earlier, the court held that any recommendations made by any such commissions may not be regarded as evidence of the Parliament's will or intention. Practices followed in the past, for example, the courts may consider them. The practices may provide useful guidance as to how the law has been understood and interpreted in practice. For example, the practice of renowned information technology lawyers, where courts need to interpret some technical words or terms in a statute. In the next lecture, we will learn about extrinsic aids in light of Hansard and rule in Pepper and Hart. See you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to look at extrinsic aids, that is Hansard and rule in Pepper and Hart. What is Hansard? In the past, the courts were not allowed to refer to parliamentary material prepared for the statutes. They are Hansard. In the case of Davis against Johnson, the House of Lords held that it has always been a well-established and salutary rule that Hansard can never be referred to by counsel in court and therefore can never be relied on by the court in construing a statute or for any other purpose. In the same case, at the Court of Appeal stage, Lord Denning had stated that interpreting statutes without referring to Hansard would be like groping in the dark without switching on the light. Lord Denning was reprimanded for referring to Hansard by the House of Lords. Lord Scarman stated that there are two good reasons why the courts should refuse to have regard to what is said in Parliament or by ministers as aids to the interpretation of a statute. What are those two good reasons? First, such material is an unreliable guide to the meaning of what is enacted. It promotes confusion, not clarity. The cut and thrust of debate and the pressures of executive responsibility, essential features of open and responsible government, are not always conducive to a clear and unbiased explanation of the meaning of statutory language. And the volume of parliamentary and ministerial utterances can confuse by its very size. Second reason is that counsel are not permitted to refer to Hansard in argument. So long as this rule is maintained by parliament, it is not the creation of the judges. It must be wrong for the judge to make any judicial use of proceedings in Parliament for the purpose of interpreting statutes. Later on, in the case of Pickston against Freeman's PLC, the court referred to Hansard to establish the intention behind the Equal Pay Act 1979. It was also held that the explanatory notes attached to a statutory instrument could be used to identify the mischief, although they were not part of the statute. Let's look at the case of Pepper, Inspector of Taxes against Hart, famously known as Pepper versus Hart Rule. This change of the court's position in relation to Hansard, as we discussed earlier, was finally settled in this case. The defendants were receiving benefits at a private school in the form of reduced education fee for their children. The tax inspector sought to tax those benefits in kind. The question was whether the reduced fees can be treated as a taxable benefit under Section 63 of the Finance Act 1976. Parliamentary debates had discussed the issue and the parties sought to rely upon Hansard. In this case, Lord Griffiths stated, 
But the days have passed when the courts adopted a literal approach. The courts use a purposive approach, which seeks to give effect to the purpose of legislation and are prepared to look at much extraneous material that bears upon the background against which the legislation was enacted. Lord Brown Wilkinson ruled, My lords, I have come to the conclusion that as a matter of law, there are sound reasons for making a limited modification to the existing rule, subject to strict safeguards, unless there are constitutional or practical reasons which outweigh them. In my judgment, subject to the questions of the privilege, Subject to the questions of the privileges of the House of Commons, reference to parliamentary material should be permitted as an aid to the construction of legislation. However, the court restricted the use of Hansard only to where the legislation is either ambiguous or leads to an absurdity, and this is the current position. Lord Brown Wilkinson stated, reference to parliamentary material should be permitted as an aid to the construction of legislation which is ambiguous or obscure, or the literal meaning of which leads to an absurdity. Even in such cases, references in court to parliamentary material should only be permitted where such material clearly discloses the mischief aimed at or the legislative intention lying behind the ambiguous or obscure words. In the case of statements made in Parliament, as at present advised, I cannot foresee that any statement other than the statement of the Minister or other promoter of the Bill is likely to meet these criteria. In the next lecture, we will look at extrinsic aids, light of statutes and in peri materia rule. See you in the next lecture. Extrinsic gates, statutes, and in peri materia rule. In peri materia means on the same subject or matter. The courts may seek help from other statutes dealing with the same subject matter as the statute or part of that under consideration to resolve any ambiguities and understand the context of the relevant piece of legislation. They may help interpret or explain the statutes under consideration in any given case. The statutes may be passed, repealed or in force. The statute under consideration may also refer to other statutes for further interpretation. In R against Waitley, it was held that Section 41 of the Explosive Substances Act 1883 should be construed in the light of the definition of explosive, which includes producing a pyrotechnic effect. In Section 3 of the Explosives Act 1875. In this case, the court looked at a different statute for the interpretation of the word explosive. In the case of R against Secretary of State for the Home Department, the court denied the claimant's asylum claim. The court referred to and relied upon the previous secondary legislation under which the asylum claims had been denied. Since the previous legislation was dealing with the same subject matter, the court found that helpful in resolving issues in the case under consideration. I hope that you have now learned intrinsic aids and extrinsic aids. I would remind you of the quizzes and exercises which have been prepared to assist you in your learning of this foundation subject. See you in the next lecture, which will be on presumptions. In this lecture, we are going to learn about presumptions and the rules of statutory interpretation. There are certain rules which are presumed to apply in relation to certain cases without the help of any statute or case law. Presumptions are normally applicable as long as there is not a piece of legislation or evidence that proves the contrary. In such a case, presumption may be disapplied. Some presumptions may have been disapplied expressly by a certain statute. In such a case, there will not be any presumption applied in the related case. For example, it is presumed that the legislation will only apply prospectively, that is, only in relation to future cases. However, there are statutes which expressly apply the legislation retrospectively, that is, to the past cases. Presumptions are a kind of rules which are needed to be kept at the forefront of their minds by the courts as well as, of course, by the students of law. Following are the few presumptions which you should be aware of, although the list is a lengthy one. Presumption number one. No statute is applied retrospectively. When the Parliament passes any laws, they will only apply prospectively. 
However, there are certain statutes which expressly provides for retrospective application. One such example is that of the War Crimes Act 1991. The Act allows the prosecution of those war criminals who are suspected of committing atrocities during the World War II. Common law is not altered by a statute. However, where a statute expressly alters any previous common law rules or principles, then this presumption will be disapplied. No offence without guilty intention. Mens rea. There is a presumption that unless there is a guilty intention in criminal matters, the law will favour the accused. Mens rea may not be defined or explained in the statutes. For example, in the case of Sweet and Parsley, a school teacher was convicted of drug offences despite the fact that she was not aware that her tenants were growing cannabis in her rented property. The House of Lords overturned the conviction in light of this presumption. Lord Diplock stated, A general principle of construction of any enactment which creates a criminal offence is that they are to be read as subject to the implication that a necessary element in the offence is the absence of a belief held honestly and on reasonable grounds in the existence of facts which, if true, would make the act innocent. Presumption number four. Legislation is presumed not to apply to the Crown unless there is a clear provision in any given statute. Presumption number five, it is presumed that any legislation passed by the Parliament will not be in breach of the international obligations of the UK or other countries. Another presum presumption is, any ambiguity in criminal cases is construed in favour of the defendant due to the fact that the defendant's liberty is at stake in criminal matters. There may also be other serious consequences, including social and financial, in case of conviction of the accused. Another presumption, established and vested rights of the citizens cannot be interfered with at any pretext. There is also a presumption against depriving the citizens of their property. Presumption number eight, final for our lecture, the jurisdiction of the courts cannot be ousted. It is presumed that the final decision in relation to the jurisdiction of the courts rests with the courts. Now, you may want to look at the rules of construction, the language rules, and the interpretation approaches that we have learned so far. Please do not again forget to undertake exercises and quizzes to help support your learning of the fundamental rules of statutory interpretation.